everybody, and welcome to today's virtual event hosted by the Commonwealth Club and Zocalo Public Square. My name is Lauren Good. I'm a senior writer at Wired Magazine. I'm also the host of the new Get Wired podcast. The Commonwealth Club and Zocalo Public Square are delighted to bring you today's program and invite you to learn more about their events by going to their websites. That's commonwealthclub.org and also zocalopublicsquare.org. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and share videos like this one with your friends and family. During the program today, we're actually gonna have time for your questions. And I'm really excited to see some of your questions. I'm sure our guest is too. So please submit those in the chat box that you see here. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Cass Sunstein, the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard University and the author of Too Much Information, Understanding What You Don't Want to Know. Cass is a noted legal and public policy expert. He served as administrator of the White House of Information, excuse me, White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the Obama administration. Later, he worked on the President's Review Board on Intelligence and Communication Technologies and on the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Board. In 2018, Cass received the prestigious Holberg Prize, often described as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for law and the humanities. And he was most recently appointed by the World Health Organization to chair its technical advisory group on behavioral insights and sciences for health. Cass, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your latest book and much more. Uh, thanks, Lauren. It's really great to be here. So one of the things I wanted to ask you right off the top is, did you use the guidelines and principles of your book to determine how much information was going to be too much information for your book? I tried. I think every author offers too much information. Maybe Stephen King is the exception. The rest of the authorial world puts too much in it. But I can say I did cut a lot in the last draft, and maybe I should have cut a little bit more. I think we certainly always feel that way as writers. Uh, so there are two stories that you share in the first section of your book that I think in many ways are emblematic of the point you're trying to get across. One is about popcorn during the time when you oversaw federal regulation in the Obama White House. And one is uh, more personally and tragically about your father's passing. So maybe a good place to start would be to recap those stories for our listeners. Okay, great. I'll tell you both of them. So when I worked in the White House, we were asked by Congress as part of the Affordable Care Act to inform America about the calories they're consuming when they go to chain restaurants. And there was a big debate, should this include movie theaters too, or should it be limited to McDonald's and Subway and such? And I thought, you know, a lot of people consume a lot of stuff at the movie theaters, and it would be good for people to make informed choices. And this was a long debate as they're happens to be frequently in government. And eventually the decision was made, yes, uh, the movie theaters will be included. And so I proudly wrote a very good friend uh, what had happened and that movie theaters would be included. And she wrote me right back a note with three words, Cass ruined popcorn. Uh, that was deflating, but I thought it was also kind of incredibly illuminating that if people go to the movies, it's a new Star Wars movie or maybe a French film about the meaning of life. And it, you don't wanna think when you're watching either of those, oh my gosh, I'm getting fat. And so the idea of ruining popcorn by providing people information about the caloric content of what they're buying, that's kind of about life. Sometimes if you learn something about, you know, illness or safety or a friend or family member, uh, your popcorn's been ruined. Okay, uh, the second story, thank you for saying it's tragic. It has some tragedy in it, which is my dad, when he was not old, he was in his 60s, he started having balance problems. He's a great tennis player. And uh, for a period, he was kind of falling and stumbling around the court. And so my mother and I took him to the hospital uh, in Massachusetts and he had a battery of tests. And after the tests, my mother came up a few hours after talking to the doctor 
and said to both of us, uh, I have great news. It's really nothing to worry about. Uh, it's something, we're not sure exactly what it is, but it's basically just part of life and you're gonna be fine and don't worry about it. And you'll be coming home soon, probably tomorrow, they're gonna do a little more testing, but this is a really good result. Uh, then my mother took me to her car and I remember it as if it was five minutes ago, though it was decades ago and her face fell. She was transformed into a completely different person. Uh, my mother had a lot of emotional self-control and she said, uh, he's gonna die soon. Uh, this isn't something where there's any hope. Uh, there's nothing they can do. It's brain tumor, it's a fatal brain tumor. He might have a year, maybe less, uh, but it's the worst case scenario. And she said, I'm not gonna tell him and you're not going to either. Now that was uh, one of the worst moments of my life. Um, it was also a very interesting call my mother made. And even now, you know, having lost her too, I don't know if she made the right call, but I'm not sure she made the wrong call. I think what she was thinking was two things and it happened really quick. She thought, my husband's gonna die pretty young. He's a happy, confident guy. And I don't want the next months to have a death sentence hanging over his head. I want him to be able to live those months. And I think she was also thinking the following, I myself want to be able to live those months. I want to have my husband, not someone who's looking, staring death in the face. So we're going to have an okay few months and I'm going to keep a secret. Telling him that he's going to die is too much information. In my heart of hearts, I think for her and for him, she made exactly the right call, but I'm not sure. And I don't know what's true for other families. And, you know, not to tell your spouse the truth about something that really matters, uh, you don't do that lightly. So it's really complicated. But the story, she didn't want to ruin his popcorn, basically. And that, that kind of motivated the book, my thought that in life, when we're told things, it might involve finances, it might involve relationships, it might involve health, it might involve safety. It's, it's kind of complicated whether even the defining information is too much information or is what you kind of have a right to. And I want to put a pin in this idea of information informing how we address health, because I think that's a big theme, not only throughout your book, but certainly a big part of the global conversation we're having right now. Um, but I also wanted to first ask you about whether this represents an evolution of thinking for you. Because in the example of popcorn, right, calorie counting and calorie, I should say calorie labels being, you know, applied to food chains across the United States, that was an issue that crossed your desk when you were the, the you know, regulatory czar, as the role is often called, in the Obama White House. And it was something that was introduced originally as part of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. It didn't actually go into, a law, into law until several years later, but that was something you oversaw. And so presumably you were part of that process and making that information widely available to people. And now it sounds like you're having a change of, of thought on that. Can you explain how your thinking has changed? Well, let's call it, as they say, an evolution. So the idea that Americans should see the cal calories associated with their meals when they go to McDonald's or Burger King or Subway, I'm for that. And the data is very powerfully suggestive that that data, that that information is good to have, that it helps people make healthier choices. And if people want to eat the double cheeseburger, they go for it, but they go for it knowing what they're going for. So um, um, the, my conclusion with respect to calorie labels is as it is, uh, as it was, but I do think, as you suggest, that the issue is a lot more complicated than I once thought. And what I think I missed was, um, when you give people information, there are two things you should think about. One, is it useful to them? If you give people stuff that's all complicated or that is incomprehensible, like a mortgage disclosure requirement uh, or side effects of medicines, it's not gonna be very useful. And so to think of usefulness is very important. Also to think how information makes people feel is extremely important. And sometimes if you give people information that just makes them scared or sad, 
um, that will have more of a negative effect on their life. Think of my dad and maybe think of the popcorn example. That will outweigh the usefulness of the information. And I now know, I've done a survey, that the majority of Americans, they don't want to know how many calories are in their meals. Most people don't want that. And the reason I think is they think, maybe it's a little useful, but if I go to a restaurant, I don't want to be thinking about weight. I want to be thinking about deliciousness. And I think we need to honor that when we think about uh, mandatory information disclosure, at least as part of the picture, not the whole picture. And uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, five years ago, I, I didn't understand that adequately. So now it seems as though what you're focused on more so is this idea of well-being, right? Um, and one of the points that you bring up in the book is that a lot of economists, you know, focus on willingness to pay or WTP as uh, a, a method by which they like to measure things, right? How much a consumer is willing to pay for access to goods or, or conversely, uh, to not have that in their lives. Um, and you say in the book that you generally have a kind of negative feeling towards this method of measurement and are proposing new ideas. Explain that. Yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with willingness to pay. I think the average human being has basically a hate relationship to willingness to pay. So let me explain the, the love part. Uh, if we go to the grocery store and there's you know cereals of various kinds or uh, aspirin of various kinds or toys of various kinds uh, for kids if you have them or things for a cat or things for a dog, are you gonna buy them? The best measure of whether they're good for you to buy is how much you're willing to pay for them. So if they cost a ton of money and you're feeling frugal or you don't have a lot, you might think, forget about it. But if you're feeling a lot of love for your dog or cat and you're feeling I can handle the $12, let's say for the mildly extravagant toy, I'll go for it. So willingness to pay is generally a pretty good measure of how much people want things, though it has, a, uh, it has inequality built into it because if you're really rich, to spend a lot of money for something you don't care about much is fine. Whereas if you're really poor, to spend a little money for something you do care about a lot is not fine because you don't have a little money. So that's a problem. But basically willingness to pay is uh, makes the world go round. Not quite literally, but kind of. Okay, that's, that's the love part. The hate part is with respect to information, you ask people how much are they willing to pay, to, and I've done this, willing to pay for calorie labels, or willing to pay to learn about the fuel economy of their car, or willing to pay to learn information about whether they have a, a, a predilection, so to speak, a genetic tendency is a better word, to get cancer. Uh, people might say, I'm willing to pay nothing for that, and I'll actually pay you not to tell me that. And I have some data suggesting a lot of people will say that. But that might be screwed up for any number of reasons. It might be people will say, I don't want to know if I have a genetic disposition to get cancer, because that's going to make me really sad. But if you learn about your risks, that can be forewarned as forearmed, that can create, create a kind of protection for you that can safeguard your life. And so to, to, when we figure out how much we're willing to pay for a cheeseburger or for, or for an experience that we've had, you know, playing tennis or something, we kind of know enough to have uh, a clue about what's, uh, what we're getting into. But for information about things that are unfamiliar, they'll happen very often in our lives. It's really, really hard to know how the information is actually going to affect us. And it turns out when people get bad information related to their health, they take a hit. And meaning it's not a good day, but it's but it might be an okay month. It has less of a harmful effect on our emotions than we anticipate. So long as we can think, you know, realistically, okay, there's a risk I face, but I can find my way out of it. Think now about COVID-19, where people all over the world are getting information, which might make them feel a little distress, but which can make them uh, live longer, live healthier. That, that actually want to get to that. I was surprised by some of the results in the surveys that you conducted. And you did conduct some surveys as part of your research for this book. You used Amazon's Mechanical Turk 
Um, in some cases, the samples were on the small side, you know, you surveyed 400 or a few more than 400 people, um, but you said that they were demo demographically representative, geographically representative, um, but still relatively small samples. And, and you were finding, in some cases, more than half of people you surveyed said they didn't want information about their health. They didn't want to know if they were going to have Alzheimer's, get Alzheimer's disease. They didn't want to know if they were going to get cancer. I How do you explain that, that, that thought process? What's okay, your best so guess? So, so I now have a lot of data from a lot of countries oh. and it's nationally representative with big samples. And as I had hoped, I'm finding that my relatively small samples of 400 are uh, really close to what big samples would show about America. So I now know kind of what America thinks and also what lots of countries think. And what human beings think about the things we're gonna discuss is not identical across countries, but it's really close. So um, in my surveys, a strong majority of people don't wanna know when they're gonna die. <laughs> Almost 75%, uh, they just don't wanna know when they're gonna die. Uh, and you can understand that. That's a little like what my mother was thinking about my dad. People don't want to know in 2056, you know, done. That's, that's, not, that's not something that makes people glad, even though it's a little bit useful to know it. Maybe it's more than useful to know it. Um, here's something that really surprised me. Um, only 58% of people want to know if the person on whom they have a crush has a crush on them. It's a little bit of a silly example, but 42% don't want to know. I tried this, by the way, with college students, and basically 100% want to know. I don't know if that's because they're more confident or because they're more available. If you're either not confident or not available, uh, you might think, I don't want to know that. It's just either it's upsetting news, she doesn't like me, or it's useless news, she does, and I'm not going to do anything about it. Okay. So that's maybe the difference between America. I think they, just, they bounce and, back more quickly from rejection, perhaps, too. Yeah, completely. Uh, but, but a lot of people don't want to know. A lot of people, most people don't want to know the calorie labels in their food. A lot of people don't want to know the fuel economy of their car. A lot of people don't want to know the side effects associated with their medicines. Uh, most people don't want to know if there's a hell. Only about 40% of people want to know if there's a hell. Slightly higher percentage wants to know if there's a heaven, but a lot of people don't want to know that either. Okay, what's going on here? I think there are two things going on in my data. One is some people think the information just isn't useful. So I'm confident that a number of people who don't want to know if, there are hell, if there's a hell think, I'm doomed, I'm a terrible person, it's going to go bad, I don't want that confirmed. And a number of people think, um, I know there isn't a hell. So I don't want that information because I have no need for it because I'm very confident in my belief. So too with calorie labels, a lot of people think, I'm not gonna use that information. I don't need it. I'm doing fine with respect to weight. Or they might be thinking, I'm not doing fine with respect to weight. And if they get into that information, I'm not gonna change even a bit. So the information is just gonna make me sad and not going to make me healthy. By contrast, some people in, in, the, in the group think I really want this information because I can use it. And the fact that we get significant percentages of people, over 60%, who want to know the side effects associated with their medicine, they're thinking, you know, I might not want to take the medicine if there's a side effect. And for things that involve saving money or inf infringements on privacy, uh, uh, the data suggests strong majorities of people want that information. So we're building up a little framework here. It's very simple. If people think in information is useful, they are more likely to get it and they might be willing to pay a whole lot for it. If people think information will make them sad or scared, that will be a reason not to want information. And it will be even a reason uh, to pay to avoid information. And that helps explain the unruly data, I think, the messiness of the data, that a lot of people are thinking this information is useful and I can handle it. And a lot of other people are thinking this information is useless and it's just gonna make me miserable. And some people are thinking the information is useful, but it's gonna make me miserable. And I trade a little usefulness in order not to be made miserable. And now we're getting at something deep, I think, about the human condition. 
And the book of Genesis uh, is all about this, the story of Adam and Eve. It's the tree of knowledge after all. And the enduring power of the story of Adam and Eve is the dilemma I think everyone catches, even children, about do they want to eat the apple, which is a question, do they want to know? Right, and, and that actually brings up, oh, continue, please. Yeah, and, and, you know, different people have different reactions because they're thinking about there's knowledge of death, but it's kind of good to know if you're going to die. And that's a... Uh, the weighing is not straightforward. You also talk about the uh, hedonic value that exists in having information, that some people feel a need to gather information, not necessarily because it is actionable, because they can necessarily do something with it, but because it feels good to have that information, or they there is actually something moral attached to it, right? that they feel compelled to have that information, to read that news article, whatever it might be, um, even if we can't necessarily change outcomes based on having that information, which I thought was interesting. Um, and that's, that, that's great. Thank you for that. So uh, the word hedonic is maybe not the best choice I as a writer ever made, but it's basically about how, how it makes you feel. So people check the stock market a lot more, their own portfolio, when the stock market's going up than when it's going down. That doesn't make any sense, except if you emphasize that when the stock market is going up, people think, oh, I'm going to see I've made money today. Hooray. Versus people seeing the stock market's going down and they think I'm going to lose. I'm going to see I'm losing money. Boo. I'm going to put be an ostrich and put my head in the ground. There are some cool experiments where people are asked to perform a task and they can see in real time whether they're performing well on it or not. And then afterwards, they're asked, do you want to know how you've done when they've gotten the sense of how their performance is on average? And it turns out when people think that they're doing well, they really want to get the information. And when they think they're doing poorly, they really don't want to get the information, even in circumstances in which it's economically beneficial in both cases to find out how you're performing. And this kind of uh, makes sense. Students sometimes can go in and get grades and if they think they didn't do well, they don't want to get the grade because it's going to make them sad, even though it's kind of a good idea to know whether you're, do you're doing well. Uh, my wife works on uh, human rights and on uh, mass atrocities and genocides. She was in government. She writes on these things. And often at uh, night, this may be in the nature of too much information, she's learning stuff about the world. Apologies to all, everyone, if this is too much information about nighttime chatter among a couple, between a couple, <laughs> but she will uh, see things that are distress, distressing and tell me about them. And that's based on a moral conviction that as a citizen, it's really important to know what's happening in the world. Um, and that's part of her, you know, that's part of her job. And there are many people, I think all of us to some extent, who think, not that information about what's happening in our world is going to be necessarily useful to us uh, and not that it's going to make us happy for sure. But part of what it means to have a full human life is to learn as much as you can about things that really matter, even if they don't make you smile. So to bring it back to health, did you write this book before the pandemic? Had you, had you finished writing you know, before COVID-19 emerged? here in the US? It was written before COVID-19, but it was finished uh, during COVID-19. So I wonder yeah. how you're thinking on access to health information and how much is too much information changed in the context of the pandemic. Some of the examples that you give, uh, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, uh, they are terrible diseases. Uh, they are, you know, chronic diseases, and they are um, certainly things that we should have as much information on, I think, as possible. But right now, what we're dealing with um, with COVID-19 is, is a little different. And um, there's so much information flying about the pandemic. Some of it is misinformation. So how do you propose, what do you propose is too much information in the era of COVID-19? I mean, shouldn't arguably the more information we have, the better off we be. Okay, with this topic, as with many others, COVID-19 really concentrates the mind, doesn't it? So that's, uh, 
I was writing it really during the end, the end of it during a lockdown. And it makes all of these questions very, very vivid. So for COVID-19, um, the two reasons to receive information or to avoid information loom really large, where the first is usefulness. And for people who are vulnerable, which in some respects are all of us, but in some respects are intensely people, you know, older people or people have certain conditions, to think they need to know, even if it scares them, because they might be scared, but alive. And, and that's a good trade-off. So to see correct information, let's start there with COVID going viral and getting people in places that are receptive to the information or not receptive to the information, uh, knowledgeable is really important. Uh, that's a cliche, but it brings home the fundamental value of information, not necessarily to make us cheerful, but to make us better off. Okay, the, the other point, which is about emotional reaction to information is, is it's more complicated for COVID-19, I think. And uh, some countries have handled this really well. And the this is, if you end up terrifying people or putting them into something that is in the direction of hopelessness, that's not good. And it can even be a cruelty, even if it's a way of um, helping public health. So it's a little like my mother's dilemma, let's call it, with my sick dad, except I think the resolution is clear. You don't want to hide the information or keep it secret. You want to give people the information with a sense of hope and maybe to the extent possible a good cheer. And that might seem a bit of a stretch, but some countries have done it. New Zealand in its, some of its best uh, practices with respect to COVID had very aggressive uh, information campaigns and lockdowns working hand in hand. But at the same time, the prime minister said, you know, we're having a lockdown, but uh, the Easter Bunny is getting an exemption. So do, the Easter Bunny is going to be able to go. And she added also the Tooth Fairy. And it gave the country a sense of, you know, ironic uh, smile and maybe even laughter in a, a very tough situation. And in New Zealand, the Prime Minister also has had a sense, we are a team of five million. That's our country. And that gives a sense of determination and optimism in the midst of some steps that aren't exactly welcome. So to provide information about COVID that's useful, and there's a lot to say about how to make it useful if it's true, and to provide the information at the same time without making people feel they don't have control or agency. So that's a new point we haven't discussed, which is in the, in the book, which COVID-19 kind of bring, brought, brings home which is that in knowledge is power. Uh, I almost call the book Knowledge is Power, but Ignorance is Bliss. Let's emphasize the knowledge is power point. If people are facing risks of various kinds, to know what's out there is to strengthen them. It's like they have a muscle now. And if they feel it as a way, in a way that's compatible with their own sense of agency, that's really good. If, if giving them knowledge also makes them feel like they're in a little hole and they can't get out of it, that's not good. But for the vast majority of us with COVID-19, we're facing something. It may be economic, it might be social, it might involve health. But for the vast majority of us, uh, we have a lot of control over what's going to happen in our days. And it can be, you know, fearful and hopeless or it can be, I'm participating, I'm wearing a mask. How about you? And there's, you know, a term now for uh, smiling. I, I love the idea. There's a term with smiling with your eyes and a mask, and partly because it gives people a sense of agency. And all over, at least where I live, that is uh, Massachusetts, uh, you're seeing people respond to the COVID-19 information with, um, it's as if it's a, uh, a motor that, gets them to do stuff, but it's also a motor that doesn't make them feel that things aren't going to be all right. 
I see what you're saying about wanting to bring a sense of agency and certainly optimism. You brought up the New Zealand example to the communication or the dissemination of information that we have here in the United States. But I do wonder if that is perhaps a, it's a simplistic solution. And it's, of course, much more complex than that. You know, when I think about something like the way a potential therapeutic like hydroxychloroquine has become so politicized and you have a situation where the president of the United States has touted that drug despite medical experts expressing concerns and FDA warning of serious side effects. Um, and some of the studies being done around this drug, you know, have been criticized for being small studies or not randomized. And there's just still unclear evidence around this drug. And yet it's become such a part of our national conversation, right? To the point where people who maybe even aren't actively seeking information about hydroxychloroquine are hearing about it and hearing snippets of information. And so when you have something that has become so uh, polarizing like that, um, how do you suggest, how do you propose that people communicate about, people in, in positions of authority communicate about it? What is the right about amount of information around something like that? Okay, so let's isolate what's uh, terrible about misinformation with respect to health and then talk as you ask about what can be done about it. So the obvious thing about misinformation is that people, that's bad, is that people believe it and they'll act uh, in response to it. Uh, the thing that's kind of like that, but worse, is if people hear something such as Secretary Clinton belongs in jail, even if they are simultaneously given a correction, they will remember it. And in some sense, remember it, many people as kind of true, even if they were told in real time that it's false. And I think that's humanly recognizable. If any of us is told, if I said something right now about climate change, and I told you right after, that's a lie, you might in the next week remember it as, oh, maybe what I heard, what was that I heard about climate change? It's called truth bias. And it's that people tend to remember even falsehoods in some part of their mind as true. And that's a real problem for social media. And it's a real problem for newspapers and magazines. And it, it suggests that telling people a falsehood, even when it's corrected, may be not a good thing. They'll remember what's, they'll, they'll remember it as true. Okay, what can we do? The most kind of optimistic and positive study I know of Olympic gold for good true news is a study within the last months finding that if people are told by scientists something involving facts, it doesn't matter what their political party is, on average, they believe it. If people are told by a Democratic senator something or by a Republican member of the House something, then things get a lot more complicated. But if you hear a scientist from wherever uh, says that we have a treatment for lung cancer and it's effective for 60% of people, people think, oh, I guess. And that suggests that for a Biden administration or for a Trump administration, if it continues, the public service would be to put messages out that are of course true and that are communicated by people who have no political valence at all. I'll give another uh, kind of clue that the evidence suggests is helpful. Uh, when I was in the government, I learned about six new words, and they're all terrible words. Uh, uh, they have a lot of syllables, and they don't sound human. Uh, one of them is validator. It sounds a little like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, maybe a new one. Validator, someone with superpowers who maybe can make things true. But what a validator in government circles means is someone outside of government who can validate the otherwise uh, not uh, universally uh, believed proposition. So if you say there's a healthcare plan and it's gonna drive down costs, if an insurance company says, you know what, this is gonna drive down costs, then that is a validator. Okay, the idea which I think should be used for health related things and finance related things is find a surprising validator. So if you can have someone who isn't expected to say, this is dangerous, or this is safe. 
if you have someone from an oil company who says, you know what, climate change is a real problem. I get it. We're going to do things to reduce our emissions. That is credible among people who would ordinarily be skeptical about the existence of a serious problem from climate change. And if you have someone who is you know, long associated with the National Rifle Association, who says uh, guns are dangerous and gun control is a pretty good idea. I know my organization is pro-gun, so am I, but we need a lot of gun control to save lives. Uh, that can correct, let's just say, misinformation. So climate change is obviously something that you've been incredibly vocal about, written about, uh, pushed policy on, um, and climate change is an incredibly pressing issue at this point in time. But I think what we've seen happen over the past several months as the pandemic emerged is that, you know, somewhere around February, there were a uh, few research reports showing that climate change ranked as a top priority, you know, among uh, American adults. And we've seen it kind of fall down the ranks as other crises have emerged, pandemic, racism, inequality, other things that we have to address. Um, but at the same time, the information about climate change is in some ways quite literally in our faces. Uh, I'm in California right now where we're, we've had hundreds of wildfires over the past couple of weeks and it's just the start of fire season. Uh, Colorado has had its second worst fire in the state's history. Twin hurricanes you know, in the Gulf Coast. Um, tornadoes happening in parts of the country where they weren't happening before. Um, and that's just in the United States, of course. We're not even addressing the global scale of this. So uh, despite having that information in people's faces, in their backyards, in their homes, in their lives, uh, climate change is something that has kind of fallen down the, the you know, priority list at this point in time. So why do you think that is? How would you propose communicating about that? Okay, so here's, um, th th this is a great question and there are a lot of pieces to it. Um, one piece to the problem of uh, climate change communication is that if people feel that the remedy for climate change is increased regulation and increased taxes, uh, especially in a tough economic time, they might not believe in climate change and they're certainly not gonna prioritize it. So the basic idea is people are very attuned not only to the existence of a problem, but also what are you gonna to do to solve it? And if they think the solution is really painful, then of course they won't like it, but they'll also, and it's a little more subtle, be resistant to acknowledging the problem or even prioritizing it. So it's effective in the context of climate change to say, you know, this is something we can handle and we can handle in a way that's going to be in many ways good for economic growth and for jobs. And people who are concerned about climate change are increasingly alert to this fact about human beings. Um, okay, here's a little data for you. If people are told, you know, we have a problem with climate change, scientists say, um, the, the only response that's gonna work is we have to have gas taxes and, uh, and prices on coal. What do you think? They don't only say, we don't like those solutions. They also say, I don't think climate change is real. It's fake. But if you then tell people the same people, scientists say climate change is a problem and the remedy is to have more investments in solar and wind, to have new industries, to have more entrepreneurial activity designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. People say, oh, I like those remedies. And the same kinds of people say, I believe climate change is real. So they're more likely to believe it's real if they think the solution for it isn't terribly painful. So that's one thing. The other thing, I think you, you give the solution in your question. Uh, the pandemic is today. Economic distress is today. If people think that a problem is something from which they're reeling now, then they will prioritize it. If they think that the problem is something from which their children's children will reel, or that they might reel maybe tomorrow, but they're not even sure it's climate change, then they'll think that's, that's not really my priority. So to give people clarity that the problems they now face, whether it's fires or hurricanes or uh, horrible heat, 
is something that is, you know, increased in risk because of something that they can do something about, then it tends to go up on priority. The, one, another way to put it is that, and there's, there's, this kind of makes sense, that uh, people think of today and tomorrow as really important, but next month and certainly next decade can be a little like a foreign country, later land, mm -hmm. and they're not sure they're ever going to visit. And climate change, a lot of people think that's later land, and I'm not sure I'm ever, ever going to go there. To make it real and imminent is a way to uh, activate attention. So I see that we have questions coming in from the audience, and I want to make sure we have time to get to those. But I have to ask you about social media, and in particular, Facebook, because you devote an entire chapter of your book to Facebook and actually valuing Facebook. Um, you ran some studies asking people how willing they would be how, how much they would be willing to pay to give up Facebook. Uh, and you came up with this idea of um, wasting time goods and how that's measured. And you found that even if people quit Facebook and there was evidence that it increased their overall well-being, they still want to continue to use Facebook. I found this completely fascinating. And I also find it fascinating within the context of the current uh, regulatory environment we're in and that Facebook is being scrutinized. Uh, and so you summarize your findings on Facebook and how people are actually valuing Facebook, whether, when, whether we realize it or not. Okay, so if people are asked, and this I did for America, the, the country, a national representative sample, people are asked, how much would you pay to use Facebook? People are Facebook users. A lot of people say zero. I'll pay nothing to use Facebook. Okay, that's interesting. If you ask people how much would they have to be paid to stop using Facebook for a month, a lot of people are going to say $100. <laughs> so they won't pay anything to use it, but they will demand $100 a month to get off. That's interesting. I think what's happening with the zero is a lot of people say, no, I, I use it, but I'm wasting my time. Certainly not going to pay for it. So there is a class of goods, which I think occupy some of our lives, which are goods which we consume, but they waste our time and we're not going to pay a penny for them if we're asked to. And so, so some people are willing to pay nothing for Facebook because they think it's just wasting time. Okay, people demand about $100, a lot of people to give up use of Facebook. And this is true for other social media outlets. It's usually around $100 to give up use of YouTube or Twitter for a month. Okay, with Facebook, there's a study, this is not my own, but it finds that if people are taken, if find their offer taken up, so they said, I'll give to Facebook for a month for $100, will you pay me? And they're paid, they give it up for a month. They are happier in surveys, they're more satisfied with their lives, they are less depressed, and they're less anxious. So that's a good month, it looks like. And then after that month, they're asked, how much would you pay, have to be paid to give up Facebook for another month? And the average answer is $87. <laughs> so it's less than 100, but they're still going to demand money. Now, I'm not sure how to understand these findings exactly. I think the optimistic view is that people who use social media, including Facebook, they actually are a little sadder. They're enjoying their lives a little less as a result, but they're learning things. They're getting information about friends and family. They're getting news. And that may not make them enjoy their days better, but it's kind of worth it. It's like people who think they have a moral obligation to know about their world, even if it doesn't make them terribly happy. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is people who say, $87, even after my good month, you're going to have to pay me that they're just making some kind of mistake. And they're not uh, fully realizing that changing their habit or reducing their Facebook use, let's say, this could be true of Twitter or YouTube also, it's gonna, gonna make their weeks better. They're not quite getting that. What, what I like about this complicated data is it shows that we often consume information and obtain information kind of mindlessly, it's not useful for us, like information about you know, health or money sometimes is useful. And it's also not making us happy as information about sports sometimes makes us happy, those of us who like sports. 
And uh, with, with Facebook and maybe in other social media sources, a lot of users probably aren't finding useful stuff and are not being made happier. Though there are plenty of people who benefit on balance from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, needless to say. But what I'm hearing you say is that there's probably enough evidence to suggest at this point that for many people, taking that break from Facebook, being off of social media is actually better for their overall well-being and, and mental health. And part of that uh, confers the, it puts the onus on the user, right? The burden in many of these cases is on the user the, to sort through piles of information, to go through end user licensing agreements, to look through privacy policies, to fit policy, privacy policies into privacy policies and to figure out your settings, right? For how much a website may be tracking you. And it seems as though, you know, particularly when it comes to Facebook, that the way the website is managed, the way the application is managed is also part of the problem, the way Facebook decides what information is seen and what is not seen. And so I wonder if you feel there should be more stringent rules or regulations around how something like Facebook I do. Run. So, so I do. So uh, I think both self-regulation by Facebook would be uh, increased self-regulation, let's call it, would be a good idea. And also government regulation of certain kinds, fully respectful of freedom of speech, would be a really good idea. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg has actually agreed with the latter. He said, you know, there are all these things about misinformation and threats to democracy, and we're a company. Government should be handling this, not us. We'll do the best we can. Um, one thing I think government should stay away from, but which Facebook itself could do better with, is the news feed. So the news feed often uh, gets people into a kind of uh, pot, which is going faster and faster, maybe it's better described as a clothes washer that they're in, which is just steaming them up, often with things that are extreme versions of what they themselves think, or which are just not true. And if you find yourself worrying in a clothes washer, you're probably not going to enjoy it very much, you might find yourself just get really angry. And that's, that is one face, let's call it of too much information. And so to think hard about how to design a news feed, which I hadn't thought of this till your question really, so special thanks for this, that if we think the two good things about information is it's useful, it helps people have better lives, and it's pleasing, it makes people enjoy their days quite apart from, you know, fundamentals, then for Facebook to think of the news feed through that lens would be a really good idea rather than using an algorithm which I don't know the details of the algorithm, but my hunch is the algorithm is quite interested in what's going to produce more clicks. Right. And I think there are explicit decisions being made by the platform, such as we're going to, uh, you know, reduce, we're going to, we're going to deprioritize news links, or uh, there are a few things that are explicitly banned, or we're going to do something different with mobile advertising. But then there are decisions that are more, much more opaque, just how the platform might handle sites that are perpetuating misinformation or falsehoods. Completely. So uh, transparency rather than opacity is a good thing for users, really good thing for users. And to think, you know, so I think Facebook has been worried about the echo chamber problem where, you know, you click on something and then you're just going to see more and more and often more extreme versions of what you already think. And they don't want to you know, echo chamber, let's use echo chamber as a verb rather than a noun. They don't want to echo chamber America. And so they've prioritized in a way family and friends over uh, news. Um, but it's not clear they've struck exactly the right balance. And to think, you know, in a way they have a community here of people who are using a platform which has many great features associated with it involving health and voting. There are many terrific things, your ability to connect with your friends, people you never see, that's a real positive. Uh, but to think about it in terms of what things are gonna make people uh, get sick or not believe the truth or start hating their fellow citizens, that's, those are relevant things for a private company certainly to think about. So I'm gonna segue now to the questions we have from our audience. And this one comes from a member of the Commonwealth Club and, uh, and it's about Facebook. 
What do you think about Facebook's announcement to ban new political ads a week before the election? Love it. So if we're thinking about a scale of one to 10, where does Facebook land on its ban on political ads a week before the election? 10. And the reason is that there's too great a risk that deceptive or false or misleading material will go viral and swing in the election, not because it's truthful and part of the democracy that we are blessed to live in, but because of um, uh, social interactions. You can have a falsehood pandemic that can create a terrible distortion. Do you think that it should happen uh, much sooner than just one week before the election? I think it's a very fair question whether Facebook would have done better to ban political ads in general on the platform or to ban them a couple months out. I think that's a completely fair question. I'm not sure where exactly one should land on it, but the idea that, that Facebook isn't exactly the right place right now, that's not clear. Here's a question from Zocalo. How corrosive would you say that actual quote unquote disinformation is when it comes from major news outlets? Really corrosive, deeply corrosive. Uh, and the thing to underline about the corrosiveness of it coming from major news outlets is that people often will believe it, even if they can easily find a correction. So for many things like, you know, does use of a cell phone increase the risk that you're going to break your ankle? That would be very surprising unless you're using it without attending to how you're walking. But things like that that are preposterous, you either will see that or you can get it corrected in a hurry. But if there's something that says, you know, something about coronavirus, and then it leads people either actually to believe it or for it to echo in their minds, that's, that's a terrible disservice. So repeating lies, even in the process of correcting them, is an ambiguously good thing. There's, there's a funny old study which says, uh, would you eat a drink from a glass that says there was a cockroach in this glass? It was washed, but there was a cockroach in it. And a lot of people won't do it, even if it was washed. Then in another version, people are given a glass which says on it, no cockroach was ever in this glass. And a lot of people don't want to drink it from, from it because they associate the glass with cockroach is, even though they're assured there's no cockroach in the glass. So I'll give a political example, the Hillary Clinton email stuff, which I believe, and let's just stipulate for present purposes, was somewhere between a complete non-issue and wildly exaggerated. Even for people who are completely enthusiastic about Secretary Clinton, or who were really uncertain and kind of liked her and kind of were prepared to vote for her and didn't believe the email stuff. Even for people like that, there was some voice in, in their head saying, but her emails, it's like that there was no cockroach ever in this class. That is, the, and, and that's a, a real issue of social responsibility, not only for you know, newspapers, magazines, and the media, but for each of us in what we repeat. Right, it's as if we were talking about the cockroach in the glass four years later. Here's another question from the Commonwealth Club. Much has been said, excuse me, how do people who are dead set on their political views so easily shun real data opposing or countering their political perspective? Okay, here's some cool data, which is that people think that if they encounter political opinions that are inconsistent with their own, they will get all upset and angry and sad. So people tend to shun it as stated. But in fact, when people encounter political views that are different from their own, they're much more on average relaxed about it than they anticipate. So this is one of those issues, it's a little like health where people are really scared about getting health news if it might be bad, but their actual lived experience after getting bad health news isn't nearly as bad as they anticipate. And so too with information that's um, uh, politically uncongenial, let's say, people sometimes are interested in it or they think, 
you know, that person who disagrees with you is a lot more human and likable than I expected. And that softens the interaction, makes it okay. I think one thing for all of us to think is something learned at hand, a, a great federal judge with an extremely not great name, learned hand, name of federal judge. He said during World War II, the spirit of liberty is that spirit which is not too sure that it is right. It's kind of perfect. He didn't say the spirit of liberty is that spirit which is not sure that it's right. You can be sure you're right. You shouldn't be too sure that you're right. And then you're less likely to shun a different opinion. And you might think, you know, you can learn something from that, even if you're not in the end persuaded. Here's a question from Zocalo. If sustaining democracy depends on popular understanding of complex issues, can there ever be too much information if a society seeks to remain open to developing new options? Okay, great. So let's say that when you buy a house, there can be too much information. When you get a medicine, there can be too much information. A doctor can give you too much information. With respect to COVID-19, we certainly can get too much information. If you're trying to handle something you just bought that you have to put together, there are versions of instructions, I don't know how you feel, but that are crazy making because there's just too much information. You want three things, not 18 things. In a democracy, I think the same thing is true. So some uh, public and private institutions do the following. They say, here's the basics. If you want more, go to beyondthebasics.com. And that can give people a choice whether they want to get a ton of information or the essentials of what they need. For when you take a job, if you have a healthcare plan option, that would be a good idea, I hope you do, or a option for a retirement plan, you can be made crazy by the level of detail or you can be given basically what you need to know. And if you like a level of detail, you should be able to get access to it. I think to think of democracy in that way is also right. The citizens have to be able to figure out, you know, whom they like and something about the issues. Uh, but people are entitled to be busy and focus on their family and friends and their jobs and want to know something if this is how they want to live their lives. You know, this candidate basically is my kind in the sense that he's for three issues that I care about. And this one has a different view. So he thinks about those three issues differently. So in that respect, he's not my kind of politician. And that's a, a simple way of proceeding. And I think that's, a, that's a, a, you know, a, a fine part of democracy. Though many people love getting into the weeds and consistent with the question, they're entitled to have a lot of transparency about the weeds and about the candidates' positions on the weeds so that they can figure out whether they think a tax plan is terrible or wonderful. Right. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I think as a journalist, I probably come with my own bias that I think more information in general is better. Like, I think there are good reasons why government agencies here in the U.S. are required to disclose certain information, why there should be publicly information, you know, publicly available information. Uh, I think there's a good reason why we have a free press, right? So I don't necessarily inherently believe that less information is better. And I, I'm sometimes wary of maybe a more technocratic approach that we can just fix it if we fix like a UI or a layout or go to this website, right? Because oftentimes directing people to a website or an app can also be complicated and confusing. But I do I wonder if, if there could be better solutions around just making information much more accessible to people and much more equitable in, in its access to people. Okay, great. I completely agree with you. So there's a website that I had some involvement with. I think it still exists. It's called data.gov. And it's basically a machinery of tra transparency. You're looking like it's not your favorite website. But if you go to data.gov, I'm pretty sure it still exists. You can find a ton of data. It's like transparency about uh, civil rights issues and transparency about airports and transparency about air quality and transparency about road safety. It's just got a lot of data sets out there. Tens of thousands at one point, I hope it's still tens of thousands. And for a, a journalist to have a presumption that more information is better, it, that's clearly a great idea. I mean, that's a foundational idea. And to think too much information is a mantra 
for the free press, that wouldn't be consistent with the mission of the free press. But if you're thinking about government providing information about you know, fuel economy, if the label that you see when you buy a car has 18 pages on it, it might not really be useful to people. And for journalists to think, to provide information with at least usefulness foremost, whether it makes people smile or not, maybe isn't that important for a journalist, uh, might be relevant to a doctor's practice because it's not very healthy if you make people terrified and hopeless. Um, but to think about how the human mind works and how it processes information, I, th I think journalists, the best, are really good at this. So they know what the first paragraph should look like. The first paragraph is a little like the label and the rest of the paragraphs are a little like the website, but they're all on a column. Uh, sorry, my cat might be popping into frame here, so I apologize. That's a you. good thing. We want he, the cat to be. He wants to participate in the Q&A. Uh, okay, back to the Q&A. This one comes from the Commonwealth Club. Joe Biden suggested having a quote unquote real time fact checker as part of the presidential debates. Do you think this is something that should be considered in the future? I'm not sure in what context in the future. I'm sure it'd be great if we just had a permanent 24 seven fact checker with us at all times, but uh, it should it be considered in the future. I think it's, uh, I love the way the question is phrased, should it be considered? The answer to that is an emphatic yes. Should it be adopted? I'm not sure. The, the risk is that the fact checker's reliability will be uncertain. And if you don't see the fact checker says it's false, then you assume it's true. And it might just be the fact checker is not fast enough or not sure. But basically it's, it's a very, let's just say it's a very thinkable idea as part of the process of providing not too much information, but essential information. This one's from Zocalo. How does having more information affect medical trials, trials and placebo effects? Okay, I, I feel I wanna claim I'm a lawyer and uh, unlike Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but uh, the placebo effect is often very powerful. And it shows that it's, it's so I love the question because it shows um, the immense importance of emotional reactions to information in determining outcomes. And this is relevant to COVID-19, it's relevant to equality on the basis of race and sex, it's relevant to basically everything. So if a placebo effect is found, and it often is found, it's because people's optimism and hopefulness is itself a kind of cure. And if you provide people with true information, which is this is just uh, salt and it's not gonna do anything, there's no medicine in it, then the sense of hope and optimism isn't there. Now there's obviously an ethical issue with lying to people always. And so almost always shouldn't do that. But it is a clue that to have a doctor who's not doing placebos, but who's saying, this could work, even if the percentage of cases in which it works isn't as high as 50. To say this could work, if, if that's a fair statement, is often a blessing because the patient is then gonna have a, a better experience and then the likelihood that it's gonna work probably increases. Here's a question from the Commonwealth Club. With all of the various ways to get information through social media, are we going too far and how and what can be done to scale back or is it too late? And I, I want to say, I find this question really interesting because one of the things that you wrote in your chapter on valuing Facebook, um, the social media chapter, as I've been referring to it, is that what is available now in terms of information is unfathomably, unfathomably more detailed than what was available 10 years ago. And you go on to say, and what will be available 10 years from now will be unfathomably more detailed than what is available now, which to me is kind of a scary proposition uh, because if we're feeling overloaded by information now, what does that look like 10 years from now? So this person's asking, how, what can be done to scale back? Is it too late? Do we need to scale back? 
Okay, so it's a nice thought experiment, which probably you can't adequately do because we're in 2020. What information is going to be available in 2030? But if you think about things about like what the future is going to look like, our ability to make predictions now for many things, sports, let's take, are just a lot better than they were in the relatively recent future. Or for things that are higher stakes, like uh, the outcome of elections, we have more predictive power now than we did 20 years ago. So with respect to many things that are gonna happen, our ability to predict will be a lot greater. So if the word, word, word algorithms doesn't make you smile, you ain't seen nothing yet, that algorithms ability to uh, forecast how things are gonna happen, how things are gonna happen is gonna get exponentially greater. Now this does have some really good features so for uh, health again, to make predictions about what's gonna work and what isn't, even on particular patients, that's gonna increase a lot. Um, it's both a good thing and a bad thing that there's going to be a lot more ability to target individuals and to say things about you based on the information that is in the world about you than is true in 2020. So things about what you will like, what you will buy, what will you will uh, be scared by, what will turn you on and turn you off. Um, Google, et cetera, will be able to know much better with the use of machine learning and algorithm, algorithms in 2030 than 2020. And this can create great things. They can know, you're gonna like this movie. We know that. You wanna see it? And that's, that's a good thing. Uh, okay, in terms of the too much information and should we scale it back, I wanna go back to my little framework, which is to think that uh, on balance, as for journalists, so too for human beings, a lot of information is a good thing. If you're a citizen and trying to figure out whether your country is going in the right direction, uh, information is really good. Knowledge is power. And if you're trying to live your life, you know, and find friends or find restaurants or find meaning in life, uh, information is really, really good. So to see the uh, explosion of information as a really good thing is, is mo much more right than wrong. The problem is when the flood of information makes it hard to know what's true. A lot of the questions are rightly drawing attention to that. And there we need trusted intermediaries who can help us. And we have data suggesting scientists and experts actually are pretty well trusted. So there's that. Uh, then there's the possibility of information involving cat uh, adorableness. And, and we're getting information right now in real time about cat adorableness, which we couldn't have got. All right, I think the, fr the feed froze for me. Hopefully it wasn't too disruptive to our listeners here, but I think that, that we have reached the conclusion of the program. And if Cass comes back, I will thank him personally, I'm not sure if he's here. But I do want to thank Cass Sunstein, the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard University and author of Too Much Information, Understanding What You Don't Want to Know. Cass, did we get you I'm back? back? All right. I'm, I'm did, back. Did, you want to, did you want to finish your thought? Yes. So um, let's make sure I'm really back. Okay. I so, can hear you. Um, See you. So it's sad with respect to things media, that if you want to keep an audience interest, do something really surprising. And so the fact that I dropped off probably wasn't intentional, but I'm not talent. Okay, okay. So sorry about that and uh, glad to be back. So, uh, what, so to, a lot of information, great. The downside is that if it's too hard to navigate so that it overwhelms us, or if it just makes us, as the social media data suggests, it makes us anxious or depressed. And this is a, a, a work in progress for each of us in our lives. And it's also a work in progress for information providers. So I think to think, you know, the, the kind of punchline of the book in some ways is don't ruin popcorn. 
So if you find uh, the flood of information to be extremely confusing or distressing, to think of ways that you can enjoy your, enjoy the popcorn of, of life. Uh, if that doesn't make your life shorter, go for it. Cass, thank you so much for giving us a summary of your book. You certainly pose some interesting ideas throughout it. And um, thank you so much for joining me in this call today. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Very grateful to you, Lauren, for doing it. And uh, just a reminder that Cass is the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard University and the author of Too Much Information, Understanding What You Don't Want to Know. We encourage you to pick up your copy of Too Much Information. At, you can find it at your local independent bookstore. And we want to express our appreciation to all of you, all of our viewers, for joining us online and sending in your questions. I'm Lauren Good from Wired, and this concludes the Virtual Commonwealth Club and Zocalo Public Square program. So thanks again, and everyone stay healthy and well, and informed, just the right amount of informed. <laughs>